So I'm going to talk a little bit about what I hope is interesting. Maybe everybody knows this and it's trivial, but I, I don't think everybody knows it and it's trivial, about you know, where financial markets come from, why they exist. And uh, so the, the title there is uh, Markets and Blankets, How Do They Work? which is a reference to a, uh, a great uh, Saturday Night Live number where they made fun of this insane clown posse song. So. So, the point of this, of course, right, is that, you know, many times people want to pretend that something is deeply mysterious and, and you know, like no one knows why things are, and you know, but no, this is a studied question, there's a lot of, like, actually it all makes perfect sense, and you just refuse. So, I'm going to talk about, like I said, hopefully why there are financial markets, because many people treat them as like this, ah, why don't we get rid of them, we don't need them for anything, they don't do anything, blah, blah. So, you know, suppose you had the problem of organizing an economy. You're a godlike being or in SimCity or whatever, right? So you're probably going to start off with some notion of maximizing some global utility function, but you know that you're going to have constraints in your global utility function. It's just not possible to do everything. There's only so much of various resources. So you're going to want to introduce something to make your optimization not produce infinite answers. And, you know, Eli, I'm sure knows way more about optimization than I do. But as a general rule, you always wind up doing something that looks a little bit like Lagrange multipliers. So you have some constraint that you want to enforce, and you say, I'm just going to add a penalty term to the utility, and then I'm going to have to figure out how to vary something like a Lagrange multiplier to enforce my constraint. So it's very, very hard if you have a lot of constraints, which is what you do have if you have a big economy. But if you think about what you're doing here, you know, some of these constraints are the simplest thing, right? Like, you know, there's only so much fresh water coming out of the Colorado River that you can use for your agriculture. So you're just going to put a coefficient in front of this scalar thing. It's not a complicated relationship. So you're saying, oh, in my utility function, I have minus some number times an amount of something. Well, that number is just like a price, right? That's how it works in an economy, right? Like the way we know that, like, you know, we're going to, like, not use more than there is of something as the price goes up until the demand does not exceed the supply. So is it also just like a price in some other context where we want to enforce a more complex constraint? Well, yeah, that's actually like just sort of your, your markup, right? So these things are sort of inputs. This is your final product. And so you have this multiplier, which is like a price on the difference. That's roughly just what the markup is to be doing that. So congratulations. We wanted to solve a constrained optimization problem. We just invented prices. So I, I think uh, it's Voltaire that's supposed to have said, if God didn't exist, it would be necessary to invent him. Right? So it turns out, if you were to start today with modern, sophisticated thought about how to run everything, you would wind up inventing prices and money. You know? So now, our optimization problem, which is super hard, has this nice property that it's really approximately infinitely parallelizable. right? Like, more or less, the utility of everyone is the sum of their individual utilities. As, uh, Margaret Thatcher, in fact, claimed tautologically that there's no such thing as society, by which she meant this statement. So she might be wrong about that, but it's a pretty good starting approximation, right? that the sum of the utility of the whole society is the sum of the people's individual utilities. And if we believe this approximate parallelization, then it's great, right? Because now we don't have to solve this gigantic problem. Everybody gets to solve their own individual subproblem. So we are all the world's greatest parallel supercomputer. But we have this problem that our constraints are global constraints. So we have global Lagrange multipliers, which is basically like the notion that there is one price for things in an efficient economy. So everybody knows what it costs to take water out of the Colorado River. And whoever thinks that their use of water is most valuable to them pays that amount. And whoever thinks it's not worth it to them doesn't. So now we have to set these global Lagrange multipliers, but we just set them by individual people buying and selling in the ways that they think are benefiting their individual utilities. So congratulations, Dr. Hayek. You just invented money, because how else do you implement the Lagrange multiplier sharing the price information between people 
they need to exchange money. So yeah, I think like to me at least like Hayek is famous for being the first person to really point out the role of price information and resource allocation in the economy. And for that he got one of those things that the Swedish National Bank made up so that economists could pretend that they have Nobel Prizes too. It's actually like a fascinating read, like the story of how the Swedish National Bank created the economics Nobel Prize. Um, the Nobel family was like, I don't know if that's OK. Um, <laughs> so but wait, like we've treated this problem as though it were sort of like one optimization for all time, and we actually know everything. But we don't, right? Like first of all, we have what's called like an intertemporal problem, right? Like there's what I want today, there's what I want tomorrow, there's what I'm willing to forego today in order to have it tomorrow. And second, like there's a great deal of uncertainty even in sort of like our best informed opinions about ourselves. You know, there's certainly uncertainty in things like next year's rainfall at the level of our current understanding of the world. So we're going to have to plan in this world with uncertainty and an intertemporal problem. So we've got this model of where we're solving this massively hard parallel problem by letting our agents make their own decisions. So our agents are going to be interested in risk management. So trading contracts like, I'll give you $1,000 every year if my house doesn't burn down. But if my house burns down, you have to rebuild my house. And that's clearly, even though what's probably going to happen is I'm just going to give away money, nonetheless, it's a positive utility transaction for me. I want to engage in it if I can find an insurance company I can trust. So now we have to have prices of risk. And we have to deal with the fact that, well, you know, I could take money and put it in the bank, or I could lend it to a company and get it years forward. So I need to know what money forward is worth versus money now. So I need discount rates. Or more generally, I just need derivative contracts. And I need some means of pricing these derivative contracts for all these different agents in this complicated world. But really, derivatives pricing is general enough, like all of the insurance, prices of risk, discount. You can put all that into the name of derivatives pricing. So now we just need to price things in this stochastic forward world. And this is where sort of like uh, two economists, Arrow and De Bru, got their thingy from the Swedish National Bank, right, for pointing out that like you could think of almost everything in this context of derivatives pricing and possible forward states of the world. So now, fortunately, our algorithm for approximately solving the global utility function still works, right? We just let the individual agents who think they know their own utilities transact, but they have to transact in these derivatives markets as well. And many people think they don't transact in derivatives markets, but everybody has you know, insurance, medical insurance, car insurance. You know, whether you realize it or not, everybody is transacting explicitly, but also implicitly in the decision, you know, you're letting the money sit in your wallet for convenience. You're not spending it now. You're spending it later. You know? So we're actually all making derivatives transactions all the time, because derivatives transactions are actually how you plan things. right? So the funny thing isn't that they're financial markets. The funny thing is that we think they're funny because we all do that kind of planning all the time. And they're just there to allow the pooling of information across agents. Because again, we have these global Lagrange multipliers. So if you were, like, if you were trying to solve this problem with a giant parallel supercomputer, you would basically just reinvent the way we do it, right? Because you'd be like, oh, the processors are powerful, but intercommunication, interprocessor communication is so expensive and awkward. I want like a small summary where they just exchange the info. Oh, I just invented a market economy again. <laughs> so. so now, if you work in financial markets, what is your job? Well, actually, it's the same as everybody's job in sort of planning, shopping, decision making, right? Now, there are jobs where you're actually you know, driving nails, building a house, welding things, right? Where you actually make the physical goods of the economy. But when you're making business decisions of any kind, including just, you know, am I buying sneakers today? Am I not buying sneakers today? Um, you know, you as a consumer, you're still just helping to basically incorporate the information about knowledge that's marginal to you, whether it's marginal preference knowledge, like I like those sneakers and not those sneakers, or marginal knowledge about the state of the world. Like, uh, you know, many of my friends tell me that we shouldn't all be worried about the uh, Bloomberg hack and we should all be buying Supermicro. It's down 45% and the story's going to blow over. They claim they have marginal knowledge there. So all of our jobs is to engage in transactions that are supposed to contribute our knowledge about marginal things relevant to the utility problem to the economy. Now in the money world, hedge fund land, whatever, 
you're not really contributing very much marginal information about your special utility. Because the utility function is kind of, I would like more money. <laughs> you know. um, but your job really is to incorporate information marginal to you about things, crop reports, the super micro story. So, you know, and how do you incorporate this information? Well, you do a transaction. You do a transaction well. If you're doing your job and you have good marginal information, then on average, your transactions are supposed to make money. And if you have bad marginal information, you're wrong, then you lose money. In principle, it should be very fair. And if you don't think you have any marginal information, then you have nothing to add. Don't do anything. Don't make any money. Don't lose any money. But one important point here is that the word marginal is actually very crucial here, right? You could know a tremendous amount, but there's already a tremendous amount of information that's been built into the pricing structure by other people's knowledge, right? I uh, have a good friend who, uh, after graduate school, he went to work for McKinsey, you know, and I went to work for a hedge fund. And at some point, I realized we had these fundamentally different sort of consultant versus hedge fund or research scientist worldview, where in research scientist or consultant, or sorry, or hedge fund versus engineer or consultant, well, in my world, being the like third expert guy in the world on something is almost useless, right? Like you have to figure some narrow niche where you are no, the expert in the world. You know something no one else knows. And if you're like smart, well, that doesn't do you any good, right? Whereas in the consulting engineering world, like actually if you know a lot, you can probably find a place where you can do valuable work and contribute something. And so his attitude towards things is so different than mine. I'm like, well, I don't bother to know anything about that because I'm never going to know the most about that. And he's like, well, you know, but actually, it's very valuable to know that. And I'm like, oh, I see what you're getting at there. Um, so in the money game, right, your real job is to find something to add where you have unique marginal information. So any and all kinds of information gathering and processing might be appropriate there. And you are literally getting paid on commission. You get paid to make prices accurate and efficient, which is a nice job. Obviously, the whole economy can't be about pricing things, right? Somebody has to be making things. Um, but your niche is to find things where what the rest of the world is saying, in the money talk sense, you disagree with. And then you disagree with them by putting your money where your mouth is. I have never figured out why putting your money where your mouth is is called speculating. And saying, like, I know that this is going to happen because, and then taking another drink and doing nothing is not called speculating. <laughs> it seems very strange to me. <laughs> so you're trying to improve the total economy's optimization problem on commission. You know, if you're not helping, you're also losing money by not helping. And if you're making money, you're helping, unless you're cheating, right? Like there's insider trading, there's political influence and things like that. But, you know, if those are not the way you're making money, it's roughly fair. Now, I uh, was a quant, right? And in quant land, it's particularly interesting, right? Because you don't typically have interesting data, actually, right? You get generic data sources. You know, now maybe you get like a giant generic data source, right? And you do something interesting in how you process it down and you say that you have interesting data. You know, but really anybody could have got that, right? So it's actually in what you do with the data. You don't have marginal information. You have to have a marginal advantage in processing the information. So I like to say that I do epistemology on commission. So, you know, it's not that different from being a supermarket. Like, you know, people are like, oh, why are there all these financial markets? Well, did anybody ever force you to go trade a stock? Did anybody ever make you go trade a future? Like, no, right? Like, they're actually there for your convenience, right? You could go to the farmer's market. You could rent an apple tree. I remember we did that when I was a kid. It was great. We went rented an apple tree, picked all the apples off it. But it's kind of convenient to just go buy an apple and not even check the price, because you know that like other people check prices often enough that the supermarket's not going to charge me $200 for the apple. Uh, you know, so likewise, when people transact in financial markets, they expect to just be able to click, right? Like, you know, they don't want to be like, should I buy IBM at this price or not, right? Many, many people are transacting for reasons where they're, we would rather pay a little bit to have other people worry about the market efficiency. So I view myself as sort of a glorified green grocer. And, you know, I try to play only in the sort of freely competitive world where there's no insider trading. Um, and in my world, I actually think I'm decreasing total financial corporation profitability. 
because the more people are competing to be the hedge fund, the less not just the profit of the people in, but the total profit actually sinks, right? Like if there's one guy in town with a grocery store, he's probably driving a Ferrari. If there are two grocery stores, right, nobody's driving a Ferrari anymore, right? You actually want the number of people trying to rip you off, as long as they're not coercing you or tricking you, right, as long as it's actually an auction style structure, the more people are trying to rip you off in the auction, it's still more people bidding. If they're not colluding, you win. So, you know, we're probably seeing this, right? Like hedge fund returns the last decade have been notoriously disappointing. And my personal theory is that Michael Bloomberg wants to be the only guy with enough money at New York charity functions. <laughs> so he just hates hedge funds. So they point this out on Bloomberg with cover stories like this. I don't know. I felt that was over the line. <laughs> but anyhow, the whole point of the financial markets existing, right, is you know to allow people to do this sort of forward planning and transacting. And what many people want is relatively simple. You know, they want to amass savings and then take them out later. And what those people want is they want to be able to click a mouse, buy an index fund in their 401k, and feel like they came pretty close to something optimal. And you know, the rest of us are supposed to get paid for making that available to them. You know, companies you know, want to be able to issue debt and equity without spending too much time going, oh, it's a five and three quarters coupon or a five and a half coupon. Those are different. No, you know, if the market is deep and liquid, you can issue whatever is convenient for you and it should be priced efficiently. You know, and you want to outsource that pricing just the way you don't want to go to that store and price apples and that store and price apples. So. And if you don't think that this is something that's very valuable, spend a couple days shopping for used cars and then come back to me and tell me how being able to do a you know, $500,000 transaction with one click and expect that you got ripped off less than a percent <coughs> isn't a very valuable thing to have available to you. So in summary, I do this for the children. <laughs> That and for the excitement of working with medium data using cutting edge for the late 19th century, statistical techniques, and there is a machine in the room when I'm learning. <laughs>